We begin today's show in Alabama, where prison officials have confirmed a group of correction officers refused to report for the evening shift uh, Saturday at the Holman Correctional Facility in Atmore. Uh, the apparent work strike comes as guards have been walking off the job amid safety concerns and overcrowding throughout the summer. Prisoners say they are, there are stabbings on a regular basis and call the facility the slaughterhouse. Uh, a guard stabbed by a prisoner earlier this month died last week. The warden was stabbed in March. This is incarcerated organizer Kinetic Justice speaking from inside the Holman prison on Saturday. Listen closely. It's official. At 6 o'clock, no officers came to work. None came to work. None of the officers came to work. We have uh, Deputy Commissioner Culliver, Warden Peterson, Sergeant Franklin from across the street. Uh, who else? Uh, yeah, Warden Peterson from across the street. Warden Stewart, uh, the captain, uh, and a white guy, uh, Wilson, uh, who else? And one other. Those are the only ones here running the facility. Right now, the commissioner is passing our trade. Warden Peterson is pulling the cart. Deputy Commissioner Culver passing out trade. Every sale, he passing out the trade. I can't believe it. To my black sliding shoes, brown knitted pants, white tweed shirt with the collar bust open, sweating at the temples. It's real. No officer came to work. They completely bucked on the administration. No more will they be puns in the game. Now it's time is going down. Democracy Now! reached out to the Alabama Department of Corrections to confirm reports of the strike by correction officers at the Holman Correctional Facility in Alabama. The department described the reports as unofficial and erroneous, but the department did confirm nine officers did not report to work on Saturday. The events at Holman come as the largest prison work strike in U.S. history has entered its third week. Organizers report that, as of last week, at least 20 prisons in 11 states continued to uh, be involved in the protests, including in Alabama, California, Florida, Indiana, Louisiana, Michigan, New York, Ohio, South Carolina and Washington. The Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee says at one point about 20,000 prisoners were on strike. With the protests has come punishment, however. Several facilities were put on lockdown, with prisoners kept in their cells and denied denied phone access both before and during the strike. Organizers were also put in solitary confinement. Well, for more, we're joined by three guests. Pastor Kenneth Glasgow is with us, founder and national president of the Ordinary People's Society, that's TOPS, a faith-based organization focusing on criminal justice reform and rehabilitation of repeat offenders. He's also founder of the Prodigal Child Project. Azura Crispino is with us, media co-chair of the Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee. She's joining us from Austin. And Kinetic Justice is also joining us, co-founder of Free Alabama Movement, currently serving his 33rd month in solitary confinement at the William C. Holman Correctional Facility in Alabama. He's joining us from by phone from inside the prison, inside Holman. Kinetic, let's start with you. Um, can you describe what's happening inside the prison right now? We just heard a, um, a clip of what you had to say about what happened Saturday night. What's happening with the guards? What's happening with the prisoners? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me uh, on the show, uh, Ms. Uh, Goodman. Um, actually, I want to uh, address some things. Uh, uh, Saturday, uh, on the second shift, uh, no officers reported to work. Uh, that was confirmed by the Department of Correction uh, spokesperson yesterday. However, they came back and tried to retract and to spin the story and said, no, only nine officers on the third shift didn't come. Uh, but that just goes to show how out of touch uh, the DOC spokesperson is with what's going on at Holman. Holman has had two shifts for the last decade. Officers work 12 hour shifts from six to six. There is no third shift. Um, to cheer that up, uh, as regards to what's going on now, uh, obviously there were some uh, concessions and some compromises uh, made as uh, yesterday there was almost an entire shift with uh, extra officers from other facilities, overtime facilities. Uh, they actually had yard call for the first time in uh, weeks. Uh, they actually ran the store. So they're trying to make some kind of concessions with the officers. Um, so I can't speak directly to what those compromises were, uh, but uh, they did have almost a half shift yesterday, a whole shift uh, with uh, extra officers from other facilities. 
And, and has there been any communication from the uh, officers to the inmates uh, in terms of why they are uh, taking these actions? Yes, uh, yes, they're clearly communicating. Uh, for weeks, we've been communicating back and forth. Uh, this uh, administration uh, really has no regard for human life, and they're beginning to see that it's not just directed at the men that are incarcerated here, that uh, the violence that they've created uh, actually spills over to these officers as well. And a lot of them are terrified uh, of what's going on and, and refuse to go into the dormitories. Uh, a lot of times when they're calling codes of officers to respond to uh, altercations, they're not coming. And these altercations are being broken up by uh, people inside the dormitory. And there's a, there's a going consensus in, in this place that if you don't have somebody that loves you or cares about you uh, in the dormitory, then you're almost guaranteed to be a dead man uh, because the officers are not coming uh, to, to save you. And what do you mean by the violence that the administration has created? Uh, exactly uh, what I mean when I say that. Um, earlier in this year, at St. Clair Correctional Facility, uh, the violence was out of control. Uh, officers were being assaulted. Uh, inmates were being stabbed every day. Uh, there were several lawsuits filed about it at St. Clair Correctional Facility. What they did is they sent all of the people who were incarcerated at St. Clair, they deemed to be problems to Holman. And over a process of maybe 45 days, they sent maybe 50 to 60 people here. Um, in March, they had an uprising. The warden was stabbed, and another officer was stabbed eight times. Um, after that, they had another uprising maybe two days later. And about a month after that, we had uh, the May Day uh, work, stri work strike. And that lasted for 10 days. Immediately after that, uh, this administration handpicked every person in this prison that they felt was influential, uh, that was uh, moving in the direction of the movement, and they transferred them to other institutions, uh, while simultaneously uh, in the segregation unit releasing, you know, those people who had already had assaults and stabbing cases, and they brought in others, and they uh, pulled the officers back and told them to step back out the dorms, and they allowed them to sit there and stab each other up, rob each other, and, you know, just a whole bunch of foolishness. And it began to get out of control uh, to the point where, you know, officers were uh, being threatened and they were reporting it to the administration that they were being threatened and the administration was brushing them off like it wasn't nothing. Uh, so they realized that after it spilled over and Officer Bettis uh, was uh, killed, that they realized that their life was in danger just as much as these people who were incarcerated here. And on Saturday, uh, they all came together in order to force this administration to to live and work in the environment that they had created for these officers to give them a taste of their own medicine, so to speak. So we're talking to kinetic justice inside the Holman Corrections uh, prison. Uh, that's about what 55 miles um, north uh, northeast of Mobile, um, near the Florida Panhandle. I wanted to turn to a clip of former Holman Corrections officer Kurt Stidham, who is speaking to the local Fox affiliate in Alabama. Stidham resigned his position after the March riot inside the prison. He's now speaking about the conditions for guards at Holman. Just because an inmate had a bad day, Officer Bettis lost his life. I think he's dead due to lack of security within inside that prison. It's impossible to follow the rules that you are giving or the regs because there's absolutely not enough security there to complete those tasks. So, Kinetic Justice, can you respond to that and then also talk about what the prisoners are doing right now? Yes, I, I agree with uh, um, the former officer to a certain extent. I'm saying uh, it, it's clear that you can't run a maximum security prison with 17 people. Uh, it, I'm talking about it, it's highly impossible, but that those are the numbers that they're dealing with. How many prisoners are there? 1,000. So, uh, you have two, you have 200 uh, men that are in solitary confinement. You have 172 that are on death row. And you have approximately 640 uh, in the general population. And these men are supposedly being provided services and protection and their well-being secured by 14, 15, and 16 officers. And like I said, it's impossible. And that means that a lot of things are going on that can't be controlled by them to the point that there is uh, no basic services being provided. There is no true security. Uh, as the situation at home is, 
uh, most of the security is being provided by uh, the street organizations. Uh, in affiliation with Free Alabama Movement, we had a peace summit, and we agreed that the administration was not going to protect us or, you know, make sure that the elderly was being protected and so forth. Um, so we took it upon ourselves to try to instill some type of discipline within our own structures uh, to maintain some type of order until we could get some help uh, from society in the form of creating a task force to uh, do a fact-finding mission to come up in here uh, to get someone like an advocate like Pastor Glasgow, an attorney like Brian Stevenson, uh, Senator Vivian Figgins, uh, Senator Hank Sanders, uh, and some reporters to actually come up in here and tell the Department of Corrections to let us see your, trans your transfer laws, let us see your segregation release laws, let us see the body charts. Let us see the, the, the officer signing involved. Let us see the documentation to prove that it is what you say it is in contrast to what you say the propaganda of the Free Alabama Movement says it is. Well, you mentioned uh, Pastor Kenneth Glasgow, who's also joining us uh, from Montgomery. He's the founder and, and national president of the Ordinary People's Society. Uh, welcome to Democracy Now!, Pastor Glasgow. Can you t uh, tell us about the situation of the prisoners in uh, Alabama right now, what you're seeing as a member of a faith-based group about the responsibility of those on the outside? Hey, thank you for having me. And um, what we're seeing is that uh, the prisoners, first of all, they did a yeoman's job. We want to give them all the credit and all the applause we can. Uh, they have overcame religious barriers, racial barriers, uh, geographical barriers, and also they've overcame uh, uh, incarceration barriers. And by overcoming those barriers, uh, Free Alabama Movement and Kinetic Justice that you have on now, they were able to organize, lead, and initiate uh, this prison strike over 24 states and uh, 40 to 50 different prisons. What they have done is made us on the outside, who are organizers and advocates, we have to step up. Because they have proven to us that, you know, we didn't look at, even myself, being the formerly incarcerated person, we didn't look at prison slavery and prison labor. Now, since this prison strike has happened, we're on the outside of looking at who we're going to target, who we're going to boycott next. Uh, Whole Foods has already put out a, a media blitz last year, and we're checking on it right now to make sure that they're not still using prison labor. We're looking at Starbucks. We're looking at McDonald's. We're looking at Victoria's Secret. We're looking at all the different industries and companies. And what's happening inside the prisons right now is that there, whenever a people comes up, Brian Stevens said, the best. Whenever we deal with the proximity of the situation, those who are incarcerated are looking at the fact that people that are, have pay taxes, for them to be rehabilitated, for them to be educated, for them to be trained in order to come out into society, because 98 percent of the people in prison are coming out, 98 percent. And in order for them to come out and be able to be productive citizens, they need to have these skills and education and all. What they're looking at is that they're just being housed. Uh, their families are being exploited by Alabama Department of Corrections and Department of Corrections in all of the different uh, uh, states because their families are sending their money for commissary, sending their money for uh, them to use the phone, and yet the taxpayers are paying anywhere from $31,000 to $80,000 per year, depending on what state you're in, for them to get this rehabilitation and education, and they're not getting it. What they're getting is being used for free prison labor. And, you know, so most of the industries and companies that own the high-level uh, 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 national media that's, that's supporting and paying them off got us believing that they're outsourcing jobs, they're outsourcing their products, outsourcing the manufacturing, and that's why we have an unemployment rate. But actually, they're not outsourcing, they're insourcing. So what those brothers and sisters are doing inside the prison is something that we all need to look at and look at our, uh, our society and say, wait a minute, we're still producing slavery, we're still producing slaves, we're still producing indentured servitude, and look at the 13th Amendment and change it. I think what they're doing is very, very necessary, and what they're doing in a very, very peaceful way shows us that our Department of Corrections, and no matter what state you're in, need to be re revisited and re-looked at holistically. Kinetic Justice Inside Holman, what does a prison work strike look like? What are people refusing to do? You're in solitary confinement, so is that right? So you wouldn't be working? That's absolutely correct. Uh, I am in solitary confinement, and no, I'm not working, but 
what a what a work strike uh, looks like in in prison is that um, usually um, around 12, 30, 12, 45 at night they 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 send for the kitchen workers, those who will prepare the breakfast meal. And when those people don't report to work, uh, they initiate a prison lockdown uh, to do an investigation to see what's going on. Uh, nine times out of ten, they already have um, advanced knowledge that there's going to be a work strike. Uh, so they come around to confirm that there is a work strike. No one wants to go to work. No one wants to be enforced not to go to work, et cetera. Uh, once that happens, um, the warden is dispatched here, and they begin uh, allocating officers uh, in the kitchen to prepare uh, these meals. And in the morning time, you know, uh, the prison is locked down uh, because the officers are trying to feed uh, over six, seven hundred people, and it's not something that they're usually doing. So this is a kind of awkward and frustrating process for them. Uh, when work call comes in the morning for the tag plant or um, the industry, uh, no one reports, uh, and that day begins just like that with the officers on a lockdown. The officers are uh, struggling to provide the basic necessities such as preparing meals and trying to get the medical uh a list done and get the sick call and so forth done. So it's a slow process uh, throughout the day um, for the officers as well as for the men incarcerated because uh, we're forced to be in dormitories uh, with 115 people uh, all day long. And, you know, that can get taxing uh, because, you know, due to overcrowding, you're already dealing with tensions and frustrations. Uh, so throughout a work strike, uh, leadership is really required because you have to uh, try to keep a balance inside these dormitories to keep violence from erupting. Uh, because one sign of violence inside these dormitories, uh, the administration will use that as an excuse to bring in uh, the CERT team and try to assert violence uh, to try to say that we're having a riot or you know, something uh, outside of the character of what we're what? actually doing on the work strike. Uh, Kinetic, we have to break. We're going to come back to this discussion. Kinetic Justice is speaking to us from solitary confinement inside the Holman prison that houses a thousand men, very few guards. Uh, Pastor Kenneth Glasgow is joining us from Montgomery, Alabama. And we're also going to speak with Azura Crispino about the nationwide prison strike. She's going to be joining us from Austin, Texas. Stay with us.